hazardous material, multi MCI, multi casualty incident, and then incident management. Uh, there's a high probability that you, as a brand new EMT, could blow up on a wreck. All right, 20 patients out there, and guess who's in charge? You would be, because the incident commander is the highest ranking person on the scene. Okay, medical person. So that very well could be you. I've been an incident commander before. I didn't really like it, but uh, it's, it's it's one of those things that you do. Okay. Uh, I was one one accident I rolled over it wasn't an MCI. But it was a big wreck. Two kids, mom, humongous extrication. Uh, I just. Uh, flattened pickup truck, the whole thing, the kids were ejected, it was a mess, it was a mess, the kids were ejected out into the weeds and thorns and all this, and it was, it was difficult to get to them, because of the, the, the thorns and the weeds, and where they were, one of them was up underneath the dash, and all this other weird thing, right, and I get there, I, I take the incident command, we're getting rescued and the thing, we're getting fired, we've got two helicopters coming in, uh, doing all this stuff, and the supervisor gets there, and I, I'm about to turn over instant command to the supervisor. And he goes, no, you got it. Just just go with it, and I'll, I'll start patient care. I'll, I'll pick up where you were on patient care. Because the incident commander doesn't do any patient care. They coordinate everything else that comes in. So the uh, instead of breaking that <coughs> continuity there, he just chose to pick up the the uh, patient care part of it, the attendant part, and then I kept the command, and then we worked through it. All right. So that very well could be you as an EMT. We went out there, you know, Sunnyvale, eat two EMTs right on the truck. One of them, the senior, is going to be the incident commander. But first, let's take a, take a quick look at this hazardous material. <coughs> This is, like I said, any substance form, I mean, it's going to, it's deadly. It might be deadly. It just might not be good for you. There's a laundry list of hazardous materials that are out there. They go through 635 all the time, I-30, hazardous materials. They, they transport them all over the place. They're regulated by the Department of Transportation, and all of them have a placard on them that identifies what's in the, in the vehicle. I hope there's a picture that comes up here in a minute. But if not, there'll be one in your book where there's a placard on the side of that truck and it has a number and a little symbol on there. And uh, you can take that number and symbol and either probably an app for it now and uh, pull that up and see what's in that and, and figure out whether or not you actually want to approach the scene. The scene might not be safe. So you're, you'll be driving up to the scene, you look and they you getting the dispatch information as a potential hazardous material site. So you're already on guard thinking that this is, might not be safe. So you get closer to the scene and dispatch will uh, give you the information whether or not that's going to be a hazardous material. Uh, we had, I had one, one time that this truck spilled over, this diesel truck spilled over with the ammonia nitrate in it. Diesel, ammonia nitrate. Are y'all too young to connect those together? Yeah. Uh, remember the Oklahoma City bombing? What that guy blew up the building was with diesel and ammonia nitrate, uh, fertilizer. When those are combined in the right order, you get a big boom. So we shut down Interstate 30 all night. And we shut down the service roads all night because of this hazardous material. Nobody went east uh, on Interstate 30. They all had to divert off because we had it set, shut down due to this hazardous material. When we look at it, the levels of training, I've told you before, never, never do anything that you're not trained to do. All right? Water rescue, if you're not trained in water rescue, don't jump in the water and try to save somebody you're probably going to be a victim. Oh, I, I'm saying it takes a specialty there 
to, to train with. All right. Mary's a lifeguard. If we get you in the water and start splashing around and come out there, uh, I, I could drown you really easy. Because as soon as you get closer to me, I'm going to jump on top of your shoulder and push you in the water. And now you're a cork and I'm floating on top of you, but you're underwater. See the problem? You're not trained to, you, you just react and you don't, you're not trained to do that water rescue. But someone that's trained would stay way back until the, either the, the victim calmed down or they passed out. And then go get them. They're not going to go out there and get a victim out of the water that's all crazy. Because right? they could be uh, a victim themselves. So that's, that's water. This is life or death here as well with these different hazardous material. I'm not even at the first responder awareness thing. That's probably where I'm at. Maybe the first responder awareness. I'm aware of hazardous material. I'm aware to stay away from them. Okay, I don't want anything to do with these other first responder, the operations or the hazardous technician, or, and especially the specialists. Because right? those are the guys that get on the suits and they go in these hazardous material things and clean everything up. I don't want that because some of the things that they go into uh, can melt your skin off. You know, I'd rather not have an accident inside a hazardous material thing and all of a sudden my skin starts sloughing off, all right? I like it where it's at. So, I don't want to do this. I'm going to leave somebody else to do this. Okay? So, what I'm saying is, if you're not trained in hazardous material, then you, you are an ambulance provider. You're a healthcare provider. So, don't try to do something that you're not trained to do. And that is definitely the case with hazardous material. Uh, your responsibility is to recognize it, right? Okay, hey, I've got this turned over vehicle. This is a hazardous material. I'm getting information what's in there. I'm going to get information about setting up a safety zone. Uh, what's safe, establish this danger zone and this safe zone. I, being the uh, health care provider, would be in the safe zone, all right? And then controlling the scene. You've got to control the bystanders where they're not running in and out of the scene. Uh, and obviously attempt to identify the substance. Uh, it's one of these things. If, if, if I'm looking down the road and Frank over there is in the hot zone. And he's got these chemicals around him. And he's yelling at me. And he goes, Randy, come help me. You're my buddy. Come on. Help me. And his skin sort of melting away and blistering up. And he's like, help me. I'm like, ah, nice to know you. <laughs> I'm not going in there. <laughs> it's unsafe. What good would it be for me to, oh, Frank, man, I love you. I'm coming in. And I go in there and get Frank. And all of a sudden I get this close to Frank. And I go, whoo, what's that burning sensation? And I look down, my skin's falling off my hand, right? Now you have two. Two victims, two patients, right? And one of them's the provider. Can't do anything with that. So it, it's the same way. Always scene safety, right? Make sure that make sure that the scene is safe for you to go into. It doesn't matter if they if there's if there was somebody across the hall in that bathroom. That's a that that's a hazardous material place anyway. So anyway, you go in there and someone they come out here and say, Hey, somebody just sliced this guy's neck open in the bathroom. He's bleeding to death all over the bathroom. Okay? I say, Well, let's contact the SRO and go in there. Because I'm not really sure if the guy with the knife is still in the bathroom or not. So I'm gonna have some Somebody with a gun, go in there and make sure that scene is safe. Now, let's say the SRO is eating his donut down the thing, and he's not going to break away from his donut, right? He's eating, and he goes, I'll get down there when I finish my donut. And so he's waiting, and this person's bleeding to death. Where do I stay? Right here. Is he going to bleed to death? Depends on how fast he eats his donut. 
But if he's a slow eater, if he chews ten times per bite, then that guy's probably going to bleep that. Or he won't eat on the run. Is that okay? Let him bleed to death? Yeah. He's just don't bleed to death. I'm, I feel bad about his bad luck, but I am not going into an unsafe thing. I'm just not going to do it. I want to see my wife tonight. I'm not going to go there. Okay? In there to potentially have that. The TV shows and everything else where they run into all these dangerous scenes and all this other stuff, TV. That's it. Where they go and they do all this crazy stuff. You won't see EMS do that. The same way here, talking about MCI later, we have a big MCI here. Let's say that, you know, uh, there's a shooter or something that makes this place unsafe. There won't be one paramedic stepping to the door until they, the police secure the, the place. They'll be all out there waiting for the police to come in and be like, we got them, send in EMS. Then they come in. They won't, they won't come through the door until it is safe. No, none, nobody will in EMS. I mean, that's a, that's a thing that we're taught from the very beginning in EMT. Scene's safe. Scene's not safe, I'm not going in. The police get paid, you know, to go into unsafe scenes. We don't. Two, two entirely different functions. All right? So that's, that's something you have to remember. What is my function? So identify it by, you know, you use binoculars on this thing. You look it up into the uh, DOT book. There's a, let's see if I can find it later. There's a book that have it. Now, now there's apps. You just type in the number and it, it pops up. And it tells you what it is. And it tells you whether or not that, uh, what the safety zone is, what the danger zone, and what's dangerous with that. You know, is it, is it respiratory? It's like chlorine gas. You know, they put a green tint to chlorine gas. And if you think, oh, this is chlorine gas. That would be the last thought that went through your head more than likely. Because it kills in very small amounts. So if you approach something and you get closer and closer and you say, oh yeah, that's that, and you're tapping on your phone, getting the app out and figuring out what that placard says as you're walking up and it's, it pops up chlorine gas and you're going, oh, that's it's not methane. I thought that's what that green cloud was. Uh, get it, methane. Uh, you're, you're not going to make it out of that scene, you know? So the uh, make sure that you're aware of what's in there. Identi- identify it. And there's a copy of the book. It's what it looks like, but the book's old school. Now they, they pull it up on the computer and they tell you, pull it up on your phone, pull it up on the computer and the in the ambulance, all right? So all that's very, uh, uh, that's available to you very quickly in this response guide. You want to make sure that you know what you're entering into, so you want to make sure that it's safe. Uh, Usually these numbers here, if you need advice, this is something that your supervisor would take on or dispatch would take on, okay? You're trying to map out a plan to get people in and out of a hot zone and decontaminate them and, and do all this other stuff. You don't really have time to uh, call these people on the phone. Someone else will take care of that. But uh, usually dispatch will start talking to them. So when you, when you come into this, you have these different zones. You have the hot zone, which, and that's the area of contamination. So you have to be in the suit or the hazmat train to go into the hot zone. All right. Then right next to it is the warm zone. So if I draw a, like a little, here's, here's the incident, okay? And around here is the hot zone. That's where all the people with the hazmat suits go in, the hazmat train. They go in. They would grab Frank and bring Frank out into the warm zone, which is right around here. It's just a 
in the hot, in the warm zone, in the safe zone, it's all determined by what the uh, material is. Like our material, he crashed on the on the eastbound side of Interstate 30. We had to shut down the west side of Interstate 30, the frontage road on both sides because of the hot zone. And we were probably six or seven hundred yards back in from this in, into the safe zone. And then you have this cold zone and that's where you are as an EMT or EMS. You're there and you're staged and you're waiting for them to bring them out. So what the, the hazmat guys will do is they will go into this hot zone, they will grab Frank, they will bring him into the warm zone, strip him down, put him in the whatever they're going to decontaminate with. Usually a lot of departments have these little swimming pools that they use. So they go, they get all the clothes off, and they have these brushes, and they dip into the, uh, the solution that decontaminate, and then they scrub them down. And then they go from that pool into a, a pool where they rinse them, and they go into another pool where they rinse again. And now, then they deliver it to you in the cold zone, ready for transport. So, if you ever had a question whether or not that, that person was decontaminated, what was, would be the first thing you looked for? How could you tell right away if the person was decontaminated or not? There you go. You're right. They would be, it, they'd have brush marks on them. But they wouldn't have any clothes. They'd have a blanket around them. Yeah, uh, it is. Like, are you talking like the brushes that the janitors use, like a big one? Yeah, they get a stick yeah, on them and they brush, brush them down. But the thing to identify them right away is if the fireman started carrying this patient to you and they still had clothes on, you'd be like, stop, stop, you can't come in here. You have to stop. Because if they go into the cold zone, now it's the warm zone, or it might be the hot zone again. Because now that area is contaminated. If you were to put that patient in the back of your ambulance, then your entire ambulance is contaminated. So you'd have to take out absolutely everything in your ambulance and decontaminate that. If you went one step further, which has ha almost happened at Parkland, they tried to take them into the ER and they're like, no, you can't come in here. That patient's still contaminated. So they had to set up a hot zone in the bay, Amex Bay there at Parkland to decontaminate not this person only, but the Amex and then the crew and anybody else that came in contact with them. So if they would have got into the emergency room, uh, then they would have had to decontaminate everything in the emergency room where this person was. You see how big it can get? So make sure that before you load them in the code zone that they have been decontaminated. Make 100% sure that, they're, that the hazmat team has decontaminated them or you're, you're going to be contaminated. You'll be in the pool next. You know? So those are the three zones that you see. Hot zone, hazmat team, warm zone where they do the decontamination. Code zone is where you are set up to... Uh, transport the patient. If they set this up correctly, it's like a drive through. An ambulance will come through here, pick up the patient, and then drive out. And another ambulance will come through there and drive around. Just like you at uh, McDonald's. You go through the drive through you pick up your patient, you leave. Right? In and out. You don't want a traffic jam in your, in your hazmat. So that, back to MCIs, that's going to be something that the incident commander will take care of. They're going to take care of making sure that the traffic flow is in and out, or there'll be a person that's in charge of that. So you have, not only do you, in this code zone, you may have too many people to transport, so you may have to set up a, a triage thing right there or a place to 
treat them in the code zone because you may not have enough units to transport all the people. So you may have to start treatment in the code zone, but that's where that would take place from. Hopefully you can get out of the weather if it's bad or, uh, or you, can, you can set up a place where there's water and, and some rehab or, or something you know, that's in the treatment area. Because you want to take, you want to start taking care of them, right? So uh, you treat them in the code zone, but this, like we talked about, this contamination process happens in the hot and warm area. They never get into the cold, code zone, and that'll be well marked. As a provider, you know where that line is. There will be somebody standing there saying, like if you you guys were the crew, there'd be somebody standing here in the warm zone usually in a hazmat type suit and it's stopping you from coming any further. That's their responsibility. And usually someone in the code zone stopping people from coming in and out. So there's going to be some traffic uh, management there of people and vehicles. This just gets into the treatment area, you know, and, and all the, the ways that, uh, what they're going to do with the, with the different chemicals and the showering, uh, the removal. In the back, let's say that a guy has $500 boots, right? And uh, he's coming out of the code zone, he has all his clothes in the bag, and that bag stays. The bag doesn't come in the ambulance. Even if it's sealed, it stays outside. They'll deliver that stuff later. Uh, you don't want anything in the bag. You don't want his clothes or anything with, with you, even though it's in a bag. That all stuff stays. So his $500 pair of boots stays at the scene. He can get that stuff back later. Uh, we just don't want to contaminate our ambulance. Because if it's a big scene, then we'll have to come back around, okay, and pick up more patients. I've left the scene before and come back to the same scene and, and picked up patients again. So you drop them off real quick, and then you go back and pick up more. So you don't want anything to sort of slow you down on that. And then just make sure that, you know, uh, they're wearing, you know, like if they were involved in some sort of respiratory thing that you put, I usually would just put a non-rebreather on them, and then that way I, I'm not fearful of any sort of respiratory droplets that they may have inhaled or anything like that, getting back out or a mask, you know, uh, in the treatment area. Everybody good sort of on that hazmat? I mean, that was pretty quick. But the biggest thing to remember about hazmat is that if you're not trained and you are just a provider, you don't jump in there and start helping these guys out with the hazmat. You stay in the code zone. When they talk about MCIs or multi, multiple casualty incidents, by definition, that means that there's a number of, you have a number of patients that overwhelms the EMS system, okay? Uh, a lot of people think of the 9-11 attack as an MCI, all right? That's debatable by definition. And you have a lot of people injured, but unfortunately, most of them die. So a dead person's not a patient, right? So you only take care of the, the sick and injured, uh, which the reports that I got, people saying that were there, uh, saying that there's a lot of people, but it didn't overwhelm the system because they were they were ready. They had a plan for it, a contingency plan for these types of things. The biggest one that I've ever been involved in, patient count-wise, was 20. Okay, and... Uh, so that was, that's quite a bit, but we didn't consider it an MCI because it didn't overwhelm the system. Uh, we landed three helicopters. We got mutual aid in from another county, uh, actually two counties, and we had our ambulances there that took care of the rest of the patients. We dispersed them into two or three different hospitals and we took care of it. Uh, it was complicated because none of them spoke English, and it was in the middle of the night, and it was cold, and they were thrown all over the interstate. But uh, so we, you sit there and you take care of this many, but you, 
that's when you really start to have to plan and you, and you think out through your, uh, what resources that you have. When you, every, every area, every EMS agency has a disaster plan, uh, and they rehearse these. You'll hear about that on the news every once in a while. All you know, the hospital rehearsed their disaster plan, or they'll come on and, and tell the public, hey, this is a drill. You know, this is going to be a drill at this hospital that uh, they're having a disaster drill. That way people won't start freaking out and calling 911, right? And so they, they practice this. This is something that we will probably do in the spring. Uh, go get a couple cars, a bunch of people, cut them up, it'll be fine. So the, they, they practice their, their drill, they know their plan, uh, and then if they ever have to put their plan into action, and then they have sort of a, uh, a, 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 a rank structure that they go off of. So you have the command module of this, where you have the operations section, these guys are behind the desk. They're just planning it. Logistics is the ones that they plan on how many band-aids you're going to need, how many splints, you know, what you might need. Most places have a trailer park full of supplies that for, the, for an MCI. That way they can go and they can hook up to the trailer and take that trailer to the scene and you have all these extra supplies. Right? One thing that we ran out of running short of in, in our little, my little 20 patient gig was IV fluids. Trauma wise you start two, out, two lines on everybody, two IVs 20 it's 40 bags of fluid right? If you do the math and uh, we carry about 10 bags per ambulance in the morning we have 10 bags per ambulance so 2 o'clock in the morning might not have our tin bags, right? So the uh, we started running out of backboards and, and, and fluids. So this guy, this logistic guy, would plan that, and then you have to have someone to pay for it, right? So the you have a finance component of that that will that will pay for it. Uh, communications, all your communications will be brief to the point. Your instant commander. Usually, it's the one with the most communications. He's in control of all the different different aspects of the of the uh, of the incident. So he's talking to a fire, talking to police. He might be talking to EMS as they come in rescue. If there's extrication that needs to be done, the media. You're going to have a media person there to control the reporters. Everything. Uh, in ours, we almost needed a uh, air traffic controller because we had three helicopters coming in at one time. But the guy on the ground, one of the guys on the ground, was the essentially the air traffic controller. He was sitting there. He was the only one communicating with the aircraft. So as the aircraft come in, he would land them side by side. I've got a picture of it somewhere. It's cool. Three helicopters right in a row. We loaded them up. They took off, and they were they were going to be available to come back as well. These patients were, a lot of them were critically injured, so we needed uh, a lot of transport. So when you, when you start looking at this, you look at it and you say, okay, here's the different. Here, like the, one of the incident commanders may be in the mobile command. You have an extrication component, a staging component for triage perhaps. If, if you have more patients than you have vehicles for, all right? Treatment, you just not going to take them over there and leave them there and not start treating them, right? <clears throat> okay, I got them out of the out of the car. I'm going to send them over here on the side of the road and let them bleed to death, right? No, you're going to have to start treating the patient. And then you have a transportation area, like we spoke of here, that flows smoothly in and out. So there's not any uh, traffic jams. And then you have firemen and other people that are working this incident, and they're going to need water or a bathroom break or something, right? Uh, everybody's going to have to have rehab. You know, the firemen, you see them on the news, the house is still ablaze, and you see four or five firemen sitting outside, drinking water, 
right? They're rehabbing. That's what the general public doesn't know. They're, you go in a 2,000 degree house, all right, in 90, you know, 100 degree weather, you come back out, you're going to have to have some time down to drink some water, or you're going to be useless. You're, you're going to fall out. So you have a team inside fighting the fire, and you have a team outside resting, and they go back and forth. Sort of the same way here, as well on a bigger, on a big, bigger incident. So all these different components that you have, uh, we won't break down each component that you get into, because your component as EMTs would be the transport component. That's who you're going to go in, fall under. All right. Uh, so I say that, and so don't get on scene and start trying to handle a rescue. An extrication when you're the transport, all right? Or don't be concerned about a fire when you're the transport. Only do what you're assigned to do. <clears throat> if you don't, then it really bogs down the system and confuses a bunch of people. Uh, so if you're not an incident commander, let's say I'm on scene, and you come up and I'm the incident commander, don't try to be the incident commander. Just be what you're assigned to be. All right. All right. Mention something if you see it's going wrong, or you think it's going wrong, but remember what your role and responsibility is during this. Right. <clears throat> the same way, if you're part of the rescue team, the extrication team, don't get your business over in my ambulance, right? Go back to your car and cut your car, stay out of my ambulance. And, and sort of that way. I don't mean that harshly. I'm just saying you're, you're part of this component, not part of this component. There has to be that sort of chain of command there as you go through. And when you do go through it, so you, you got this big wreck. Let's say there's 20, 20 patients, 30 patients out there. You're not really sure right now, so you're setting up for an MCI you're calling in everybody, you're calling in the fire department, you're calling in the helicopter, the air service, rescue, supervisors, everybody's coming out to your scene. Where you have, let's say all you guys are patients here, okay, but she's my partner, so she's going to help me triage you guys because you're all patients. In, in uh, let's say the, the scene is safe, the, the chem lab blew up, so I have. 32 patients, approximately 30 patients or so, that was involved in an explosion in the chemistry uh, lab, which is what they practice for here, actually. Okay, So, me and Alexis don't go in, and we're going to start triaging, and we're going to have these tags, and I'm going to be the triage commander. That means I'm in charge. I don't triage patients. She triage patients, okay? I keep track of who she's triaging. So the, uh, if there's just us two, if there's two or three, then I give triage tags out to whoever can triage. Let's say there's two crews there, then I'll give two more sets of tags out so they can start triaging, okay? And then I'll, I'll step back and I'll start counting and keeping track. But what they do is, here you have these tags or something very similar to it, and the color coding is international. It's the same colors no matter where you go on these tags. So you will go across, and as you come across, uh, up on a patient, you will stop and triage that patient. Triage is French for sorting out. And you're sorting out these different patients according to their injuries. So as you're saying here, uh, priority, let me get my priorities straight here. Because these are uh, life-threatening. We'll start here with walking wounded. All right? Or on here is the green tag, minor injuries. So the first thing that we would say when we come in and we get our 30 patients, we're starting to make that size up, right? The first thing we would say is, if you can stand up and walk, come out here. So we get all the walking wounded. I mean, you still may have cuts and scrapes. You may even have a broken arm, right? But you can stand up and walk. Come out here. And so I'll get, I'll keep the math easy. And let's say I had 10 out of 30 that are walking wounded. 
So I'll get that 10 out here, and I'm going to sign in the green. So I'll tear off uh, up to this green tag here. And I'll place this green tag here with the red and the, the yellow with them, okay? So I'll place that on them, and then I'll try to fill out this part here. Or I may assign that to somebody. Let's say you're part of the walking wounded and you, you got it together. You're, you're not in the panic. I say, okay, I want you to take these ten and keep them over here. Not let them go anywhere. So I go back to the, the uh, triage officer. I say, okay, I got ten walking wounded. They're over here. They're the green area. And we're putting green tags on all of them. Okay? So as we go along, the next one that we look on is... We, we triage the patient and we triage them out and the delay means that they don't need immediate treatment. So that could be like a broken leg still, okay? Broken arm. They just can't get up and, and walk, but they're not dying. So the green is minor walking wounded. The yellow would be delayed, sort of a non-life-threatening illness. And we sure start trying to stage those guys there uh, as well. So we sort of pushed all, we get all the yellow ones back in the corner, okay? And now we got the immediate transport. It's the life threatening. So we would place these tags on the red on, on them. You, you time on there or whatever, okay? On here they would, uh, you would check, check it off. And so if you were immediate transport, I would come up and I would check the red and tie this to you. And then tear this off because it has a corresponding number with the tag. All right? So, and I would take this part back to the triage officer and say, here, here's these. So now they're keeping track. Okay, I got 10 walking wounded. I got five immediate transport and the rest are delayed. Okay, perhaps. Okay. And the way that you do that I'll pass the card around so you can tell. It's that you, it, it only takes just a second to triage them out. So if their respirations are over 30, if they have no, or they have no radio pulse, or they are unable to follow simple commands, then they are immediate transport. So respirations over 30, no radio pulse. No radio pulse tells you that your pressure is lower, your blood pressure is lower than 80. Uh, or the, you have a mental status change, you can't follow simple commands, then you are considered immediate transport. Everybody else is either walking wounded or delayed or dead. Okay? Now you look at this, the, the dead or the black tag, uh, these guys either have no respirations uh, <clears throat> with the head tilt chin lift <coughs> or if you place an OPA in, they can't maintain their own airway. So they are considered deceased, or black tag, if they can't maintain their own airway without somebody sitting there, or they have a pulse. Or they, I mean, they don't have a pulse. So they're in cardiac arrest, or they can't maintain their own airway. So that means that this person that you walk up on, they're unconscious, unresponsive, you... You do a head tilt chin lift and they start breathing again, right? And they can't take an OPA. They have to physically, you have to physically stay there with that person and hold their airway open. Then they're considered black tag. You step over them and go to the next, you tag them and you step over them and go to the next person. Do you that, have to start CPR if they have a pulse of breathing? No, that's a good question. No CPR at this time. If you need CPR, you're considered deceased or black tag. It doesn't matter the circumstance. Right? It doesn't matter how young you are either. That's what the school here has a problem with. Like if we went in there and there was this person over here that all I had to do was sit there and hold their airway open and they, they start breathing, right? But what does that take? 
Yeah, it takes a person to sit there. We don't have that. We don't have that availability to spare that person to hold that airway open. So you you would black tag them, unfortunately, and then go to the next person. Let's say the next person you encountered, they're in cardiac arrest. That's an easier decision to make. You would black tag them and go to the next person. See, the problem is here when when the emotions get in the way. You know, if you let that happen, then it breaks the whole system down. All right, I've seen it broke down. I've seen the system break down, and it's a, it, it becomes a disaster when it happens. It is a it is a well lubed machine if this triage system is used the way it's supposed to. When it's not used the way it's supposed to, then it becomes, then you just get chaos. Because I can't spare, you know, I have 30 patients, I can't spare two or three people uh, to go and add relief, to hold someone's airway open or, or do that. Because, the question is because I have, they, they, they use the term, you have more viable patients. So now I'm sitting over here. Here's the, cert here's the scenario that you're going to get in. I'm sitting over here holding this person's airway open, right? The house is over there bleeding from her femoral artery. She's going to bleed to death in, in a minute, right? Who's more viable? Her. Her. Easy decision. You're a more viable patient. You're alert and oriented. You're just bleeding out. But if I stay here, then she's going to die. The more viable patient has the potential of dying. Okay, it's it's a harsh reality. Um, when you put in the OCA or the manual, like if the person is just giving you know, how to open it. Yeah, good question. If you can go to that person and just put the OPA in, and that works, that o keeps their airway open, and you don't have to stay there, then you would red tag them put the OPA in, and then move to the next person. The only time that you would uh, black tag someone that uh, like that is if a person actually had to stay there and render aid of some sort. All right? So it's, it's important here, I'll pass these two tags around. It's important that you understand this system, this triage system, because of... If you get into a situation where there is multiple patients, you're, you're going to have to make very difficult decisions. So if they're like bleeding out and you just have to hold pressure, do you just tell them to hold the pressure? Hold their own pressure, yeah. they got to hold their own pressure, okay? You can't afford... You don't leave any. The people who I've had triage and they keep moving. They don't stop and render aid. We, we sort them out. We get them into the priorities, the, the, the high priority or the low priority. And then we go back as people are coming in, as help is coming in, then we start treatment. Then we set them up in a treatment area and we start treating them. And we continue to triage them because a yellow might turn into a red, right? So we have to keep triaging them out and, and, and keep doing that and then get them out. So, you know, simple triage, rapid Treatment. It is foundation. It's a system that is simplistic, speedy. As long as you uh, keep to the to the rules of triage, you'll be okay. And then we've already talked about this. Are you able to walk? Then get out. You know, get over to the green area. Sign somebody there. Check the respirations, their mental status. <clears throat> you know. Unresponsive, not breathing, no pulse, they're deceased. Breathing, no apparent uh, pulse, just a priority one. You know, check capillary refill, check the mental status on that. And the good thing is about it, you have the card with you. So, I mean, you don't have to memorize this for testing purposes, but you, you have the card with you when it really counts. So even if you can't remember it, you can, at least you have your cheat notes to the side, you can... You can look at the card. And then there's the, like I said, there's the different categories that you can see on the, car, on the card itself. 
It becomes a little tricky as you start staging people, but the more help that keeps coming in, the, the, everything sort of, uh, you know, you, you can start treatment, you can start transport, you can re-triage. To, to triage about, you know, triage our 30 patient scenario here, it might take two minutes to do that. And then we start sorting them out a little bit better. But you're talking about a big MCI. When you're talking about, a, okay, now you have 100 patients. Wow. That's a lot of sorting out, and that's a lot of very intricate keeping track. You don't want to forget about a patient. You want to keep count of your patients. That happened to us one time. I was the second unit in, and we were counting patients. You want to make sure that you have everybody accounted for. You don't want to leave somebody on scene. And we were getting ready to wrap this thing up and, and go, and the, and the person that was, help, that was involved in the wreck but knew the passengers said, hey, I think there's a, somebody missing. There's 17 of us, and we only count 16. We're missing a body somewhere. So the fire department started looking for the body, and this person was ejected, out of the van, and he landed up into the back. They hit a dump truck in the rear, <clears throat> and uh, they were ejected out, and they landed in the back of the dump truck. Nobody looked in the back. So that's where this person was. He was in the back of the dump truck. You know, a uh, tree. I've heard of people getting in a tree. You're, you're trying to count people, and you go, there he is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they... Uh, not with the living, but they were up there, you know. So you, but you have a count for for the people that you that you have. Very important to keep the count of of who you have. So last couple of things, there is some psychological aspects to this. There's a lot of hurt people, all right. A lot of people that might be dead and dying, uh, depending on on the scenario. Like this scenario here, you have a lot of young people you know, involved in it. So there's a lot of psych psychological aspects to the provider, you know. Uh, you have to, you don't want to come off as just, I don't care, but you have a job to do, right? So you've got to do your job first and then worry about the public opinion later, you know. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been People have called in and complained because they like, but well, he said he doesn't seem like he cares. You know, he was just so short with us. Well, you, your pops were dying. <laughs> okay, so you want me to be nice to you? Or you want me to take care of pops? Okay, because I have a lot to do here taking care of pops, and you're just a bystander, family member. I care about you, but I care more about the person dying, right? So that's the way that. You're perceived as sort of cold and, and short at times and to the point, and people don't like that, you know. Uh, but you, you have to take care of your business. If you don't take care of your business, people are going to die. So that's the harsh reality of, of, this, of this situation here. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're, you're taking care of the, your patients. All right? And then afterwards, there could be a time, remember when we talked about... Uh, you know, uh oh, what's that called? Old moment. Critical incident stress debriefing. What? That's in the early chapters of the well being. You have critical incident stress debriefing. Oh, yeah. So you, you might get together, you might have one of those, you might have get together with a bunch of people and have CISD, all right? <laughs> but you want to make sure overall, okay? Any, you know, any call, it doesn't have to be a big MCI or triage, it could be, you know, one person, one patient that, that uh, you're having problems with. On any calls, no matter EMS, medicine, nursing, right, if you have a problem with the call or a patient and that is continuing to bother you, all right, to the point I can't sleep, I can't eat, I'm so depressed, you know, we worked this little baby, baby didn't survive, you know, and I can't, you know, I can't look at another, I can't look at another infant without crying, right? One of those type things, then 
that's something that you do. You need to you need to seek some help on that. Uh, in the opposite of that as well. You know, if you see a baby and all you do is get mad, right? You don't cry, but you got mad. You got sort of some built up resentment every time you see a toddler, or you know, or whatever the case may be. Then, then you need to to get help with that. Your well being is. I usually take quite a bit of time, you know, over that, because you're going into a field of high stress and high burnout, in an extremely high rate of alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and divorce. You know, uh, I can I can name out of the thirty people or so I work with on on the ambulance, I think I can name half of them that are divorced. I mean, off the top of my head, I can name at least ten or so that are divorced or that abuse alcohol. You know, they leave work and they go get drunk. That's not healthy. All right, they need to deal with. They need to be able to deal with that problem. These type of incidents magnify that. They multiply it. All right. So that's something that, no matter what field you go into, that's something that you're going to have to. To overcome, you don't you don't have to work that out. 